what this means again is that at least we believe that corporates in you know hard to abate sectors will need to uh, deploy technologies such as renewable energy hydrogen as well as carbon capture what will also be important uh, is to have access to international finance as well as uh, support on the r and d front last but not the least uh, you know after a lot of noise actually uh, india has finally declared its net zero target uh, which is by 2070 and uh, this means that not only next generation technologies but even uh, things like you know afforestation green buildings etc will become uh, very very important Right, so so very happy to see the fraternity join in. Uh, welcome to the Blue Circle. It's such a big privilege and pleasure to connect with everyone and our distinguished keynote speaker, who is handpicked because of the think input and the rich experience he brings in. Thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us. Most of whom are CEO, CXOs, and senior leaders. Many of them are our members and are repeat visitors to our webinars. This is very encouraging and motivates us to provide even higher levels of dialogue through the online mode as well. For those of you who are new with us today, Blue Circle is the world's first sector-specific networking app for business leaders that's built in India. We currently focus on 20 sector communities such as e-mobility, renewable energy, real estate, aerospace and defense, and many more. We also present socio-economic insights, which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market. Along with our weekly webinar series and our digital publication, you will be happy to know. that we have recently launched the first version of the blue circle app for leaders somewhat like the sector specific linkedin for senior leaders a space to have meaningful conversation connect with over 10000 plus like minded leaders from india and across the globe house high quality curated content and access business opportunities across these sectors those leaders among you who are interested please do join us i will share the link to the app at the chat section and will soon be sending out invitations to our guests post today's discussion Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mr. Pranav Master, Director Chris. He has a decade-strong experience in the consulting and research space, with with assignments ranging from entry strategy formulation, project feasibility studies, and bid advisory to market assessments. Over the past six years, he has worked with power generation, transmission, and distribution players in both private and public sectors. He has also worked with global energy equipment and mining majors looking to foray into the Indian market especially on entry strategies business planning and market projections and for today's topic Mr Pranam master will be discussing fueling energy transition now i request Mr Pranam master to please begin the session thank you thank you gautam and a very warm welcome to everyone hope uh, all are doing well I'll just share my screen. So, Gautam, if you can confirm, if uh, you know, you can see the screen. Yes, you can see it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so now, uh, I think uh, Gautam has already laid the context. Uh, so I'll zoom in straight uh, to the topic uh, for today's uh, discussion. Uh, I think we would have all heard uh, the kind of thrust that the government has laid on energy transition uh, in the budget twenty uh, two. what i'll do is i'll try to decode some of the critical themes uh, uh, that were announced and uh, what does it mean in terms of impact on the sector and what do we believe uh, that can be done further uh, to ensure on ground implementation uh, so without further ado i'll jump straight into the presentation just to set the context uh, uh, india has set out uh, you know five goals as part of its commitment to fight climate change at cop26 as we all may be aware the first one being 500 gigawatt of non fossil fuel based installed capacity by 2030 second being 50% of energy uh, to be met from renewable energy by 2030 uh, what this means is that large scale investments uh, will be required in renewable energy as well as integration of renewable energy and hence investments in energy storage as well as power transmission 
Point three is to reduce one billion ton of CO two uh, emission between two thousand twenty one and two thousand thirty, and hence this means that uh, you know your coal based or fossil based capacities will need to be phased out, and there will have to be significant thrust on cleaner technologies. Uh, there is also a intent to uh, reduce uh, carbon intensity of the economy by forty five percent by two thousand thirty. Now, what this means again is that at least we believe that corporates in you know hard to abate sectors will need to uh, deploy technologies such as renewable energy, hydrogen, as well as carbon capture. What will also be important uh, is to have access to international finance as well as uh, support on the R and D front. Last but not the least. Uh, you know after a lot of noise actually uh, india has finally declared its net zero target uh, which is by 2070 and uh, this means that not only next generation technologies but even uh, things like you know afforestation green buildings etc will become uh, very very important now through this slide i just wanted to lay the backdrop that has actually driven some of the bu budget announcements and what the government intends to achieve. So this slide kind of captures that uh, agenda of the government. And this is what has really driven some of these announcements. Now, like I said, you know, I will focus on some of the major announcements, some of the major themes, and what does it mean in terms of uh, impact. Uh, now to promote green infrastructure investments and to encourage Make in India, the government has allocated an additional 19,500 crores uh, to the production-linked incentive uh, for high-efficiency solar modules. Now, this announcement, if you club it with the fact that they have also simultaneously announced a 40% duty on uh, customs duty on imported solar modules and uh, the recent uh, revised ALMM list, this entire uh, three aspects make this extremely powerful. And so far, what we have seen is that the bids have been conducted five to six gigawatt has been, uh, you know, allocated with the initial PLI of uh, four and a half thousand crores. Uh, but now the balance uh, 16 players, which have been put on the waiting list could also see uh, allocation of um, uh, capacities uh, based on the additional amount that has been allocated through the budget uh, recently. Now, a broad calculation uh, suggests that the PLI scheme could provide an incentive of up to three cents per watt peak, uh, you know, based, this based on the bidding that has happened so far. And if you assume customs duty, uh, indigenously manufactured modules could potentially be, you know, at par or even lower than imported ones, as you can see on the chart. Now, owing to a confluence of all these, uh, you know, reasons, uh, there could be some near-term cost pressures. But uh, until the time, you know, you have some uh, fresh capacities coming on stream. But what it means is that, uh, you know, it will provide long-term energy security. I think from that standpoint, it is very critical. And also, you know, if it gets uh, implemented in a, in a successful way, India could also tap uh, uh, export potential uh, to capitalize on the opportunities that are there globally as well. Keeping in mind now the large scale investments that are required to support energy transition, the government also announced tapping of the sovereign bond, sovereign green bond market, actually. Uh, if you see that until the mid of 2021, over 100 billion uh, US dollars have been raised through this uh, sovereign green bonds. Uh, most of this has been done in the European uh, markets. Uh, if one were to get some sense of you know what is in store uh, as far as sovereign green bonds are concerned uh, we've tried and done some analysis of few developed as well as some developing countries and what it essentially suggests is that uh, you know debt tenors uh, can be quite long which is uh, provides significant flexibility it can range anywhere from you know 10 years to 30 years uh, interest rates are typically at par or, you know, some 15 to 20 bips lower than conventional bonds. Uh, and here you can see the kind of differential rates between uh, European countries like France, Germany, as well as Asian countries like Indonesia. Um, the other aspect is, I think, for at least some of the domestic, uh, 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 for some of the developing countries, sorry, uh, 
large availability of capital is an issue and this clearly will help to mobilize a significant capital if you can see uh, single issuances have been upwards of 10 billion us dollars and countries such as hong kong have in fact raised significant quantum accounting for almost 10 percent of the total sovereign uh, debt so uh, this has been already quite popular uh, in several nations it obviously opens up a pool of new investor category, so which is again very important. And last but not the least, I think it it, it sends a very strong signal uh, and an intent uh, to the world in terms of the country's commitment to uh, green infrastructure. And from that perspective, it's a it's a big uh, it's seen as a big positive. Uh, but some of the aspects that we believe the government should consider uh, one is I think a complete alignment uh, with. Uh, uh, frameworks uh, such as the GBP, that is the green bonds principle. So in that sense, clear identification of use of proceeds, project evaluation process, uh, managing those proceeds, and finally reporting uh, uh, its use is, is very critical. Uh, needless to say, I think uh, all stakeholders will have to collaborate uh, very closely, including RBI, MOF, as well as the different line ministries to determine you know, the quantum uh, of uh, bonds that will be raised, timing of the bonds, et cetera. Uh, popularizing this, uh, having roadshows, international prospectus, again, will become important basic promotion of this issuance to attract the right set of uh, investor uh, investors will be quite important. But from what we understand and what we hear so far is that the government is currently looking at least at the domestic market and rupee denominated green bonds. Um, now, if you see in India, institutions really do not have uh, a formal uh, sustainable investment framework and hence some push or incentive will need to be extended by the government or you know even potentially uh, large government-backed institutions such as uh, LIC, EPFO could be mandated to uh, subscribe such bonds. Obviously, a lot will depend upon the size and scale of the issuances and the timing of the same. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a very, very uh, critical move uh, and will go a long way in uh, supporting investments on uh, green infrastructure. Uh, the finance minister also reiterated uh, the biomass utilization policy, which was released in uh, 2021 for co-firing of uh, uh, biomass with coal. Uh, now this measure, if it is implemented, uh, uh, you know, will help reduce carbon emissions from two of the largest uh, emitters. One is the power sector clearly, and second is the agriculture sector. Uh, now, if we assume 7% blending, uh, uh, from the second year onwards uh, that has been uh, stipulated in the policy, um, we could see a displacement of close to 40 uh, million tons of coal. Uh, what this means is that apart from direct emissions, you know, over a period, it will also help conserve uh, natural resources as lesser amount of coal will be mined. And this policy will also simultaneously help uh, improve the rural economy, given the extra income that uh, it will generate for farmers, as well as you know, job opportunities to locals. But there is a flip side to this as well. Um, such sort of uh, co-firing or blending will increase tariffs for coal-based plants by about uh, 11 odd pesa. This is a broad level calculation. But... Uh, it will be passed on to the DISCOMs as well under change in law uh, for competitively bid projects. So in that sense, it is taken care of. But uh, what it essentially has, it has an indirect impact and it could mean that coal-based IPPs, most of who are already grappling with low PLFs, uh, they become further competitive, uncompetitive if you compare them to renewable energy. Uh, moreover, it will also add to the cost burden of DISCOMs uh, who are already quite stretched. Uh, but if this were to be implemented, I think for successful on-ground implementation, uh, some critical aspects uh, that uh, must be made note of uh, or should also be par in parallelly implemented. One is, I think, clearly a timely pass-through uh, of cost and approval of the same by the regulators to DISCOMS. Uh, we know that uh, the biomass... Uh, uh, is fairly fragmented in nature. And hence, from the government uh, perspective, if a nodal agency could be set up to aggregate such biomass, that I think will be a, a, a big shot in the arm for this kind of a program. Uh, 
obviously such uh, schemes will ent- will require capacity building will require awareness uh, those are uh, very critical uh, to ensure on ground implementation and last but not the least i think uh, uh, enforcement of such uh, carbon reduction in- initiatives is very important uh, because we've already seen that uh, the implementation of fgds for coal based plants uh, and the status of the same you know it has been quite uh, weak at least on uh, ground so in that context uh, uh, enforcement and ensuring some of these uh, uh, market mechanisms are uh, taken care of for successful implementation energy storage is uh, another uh, important uh, uh, piece in the entire jigsaw uh, especially as we see the prominence of uh, renewable energy and ev penetration uh, rising as well as uh, requirement for backups uh, uh, as that multiplies we expect at least uh, a large chunk of the demand to come from the mobility segment uh, close to about 250 gigawatt hour uh, given that the penetration of you know three wheelers will be you know 50% plus by 2030 and on the other hand you know you'll have buses which will be at about uh, 16 to 18% so Uh, that will drive demand from the mobility segment stationary grid storage uh, uh, will also be one big demand driver we expect about 30 odd gigawatt of uh, energy storage with about 3 to 4 hours of backup so which will translate to essentially 100 gigawatt uh, for grid scale storage and similarly for backup purposes you will have requirement from data centers telecom towers uh, you will also have off grid applications which will also substantially contribute uh what the government has done essentially is declared energy storage as part of the infrastructure projects and this will lend uh, support in terms of credit availability but again similarly here i think this in stand alone uh, uh, will not help and it needs to be supplemented with uh, certain measures uh, uh demand creation will be very important uh, uh, providing incentives for storage during peak time generation say higher payout for fast responding systems such as energy storage uh, payment security these are some of the important aspects which will have to be taken care of in parallel uh, thrust on r&d with some partial grants uh, is another important aspect uh, this is uh, important given that you know battery metals uh, uh, are limited in nature and hence uh, focus on r&d and how we could uh, uh, use limited amount of nickel cobalt uh, some of these limited uh, resources will become important uh leveraging g2g relationships for uh, raw material uh, technology transfer uh, are, are are also quite critical and now when you club some of these measures with the fact that uh, 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 battery costs will start declining you will see scale uh, kicking in and uh, a confluence of all this will help improve uh, adoption of uh, energy storage systems um while the overarching energy transition theme uh, uh, from the government is positive for the renewable energy sector we believe that there were some hits and misses as far as the developer community is concerned for example the levy of uh, 40% and 25% customs duty on uh, modules and cells will increase the near time costs uh, near term costs uh, given that uh, you know domestic manufacturing capacities will take some time to come on stream and higher tariffs essentially could deter discoms from signing tpas also there was no respite uh, that was there on gst which was uh, hiked uh, recently uh, green hydrogen uh, there was uh, unfortunately no mention but uh, we understand that uh, there is some announcement that is there on the anvil uh, which we are eagerly uh, all awaiting uh, on on the discom front again there was uh, no call out uh, uh, in terms of uh, addressing the delayed payment situation which could have provided some cheer to renewable developers but a higher fiscal deficit of 4% with five, half a percent tied to power sector reform i think that kind of continues so that's uh, at least a mild uh, positive uh, but there are certain hits as well uh, so the allocation to the renewable energy sector has increased by 20% which will help uh, you know support the overall ecosystem of uh, of uh, renewable energy uh, ireda has seen equity infusion uh, this will again help uh, provide uh, equity uh, sorry better credit availability uh, to the sector as a whole so again this uh, is a positive 
so some hits and misses as far as uh, uh, a renewable energy but at an overall level for the ecosystem as a whole i think it's a, it's a big positive um to ensure a holistic uh, approach to the environment the government has also announced an extended producer responsibility which will promote uh, a circular economy we've seen that over the last 8 to 10 years there have been some epr mandates for few sectors uh, but you know a poor infrastructure a large share of unorganized sector um a uh, lack of responsibilities through the value chain uh, and limited uh, monitoring has uh, had limited has, because of which there has been limited success but now with the epr being extended to 10 sectors and it being deepened the government should ensure uh, uh, appropriate on ground measures to ensure uh, effectiveness i have tried to enlist some of them i'll just focus on a select few one i think is uh, you know collection of data i think that's a very first step to understand availability type location of the waste and i think this has been done very well as far as uh, the scottish environment protection agency is concerned so i think there are a lot of learnings that we can take from there uh another important point is instead of looking at recycling reusing uh, one must focus on uh, on the reduction of waste at at source itself uh, uh by you looking at alternate or sustainable uh, materials one can also look at take back initiatives which have been implemented in eu very successfully for return of pet bottles and e waste where you know some sort of cash backs discount coupons environment incentives or even say societal uh, incentives are given um similar to carbon trading i think uh, credit uh, trading systems such as recycling credits <clears throat> which are available in markets like the uk could also be looked at so i think this is uh, still at an initial stage and i think uh, uh, the government is in the process of developing a framework and guideline but some of these measures that i spoke about will be critical uh, to ensure on ground implementation Uh, so 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 far i spoke about some of the major announcements that have happened uh, but i just like to spend a couple of minutes on some of the technologies that i believe uh, that would require necessary thrust as we transition to net zero um if you see the slide i think vertically what i have done is have i uh, looked at some of the clean technologies and horizontally plotted the technology readiness and the co2 abatement potential in different end use sectors offshore uh, uh you know is important while it is currently expensive uh, we will need to gradually uh, explore this because uh, given that a large proportion of incremental capacity will come from renewables and renewable being land intensive and depending on dependent on natural resources uh, alternate options will be have to be evaluated um a large bet we spoke about it partially green hydrogen will be a large bet and uh, as we can see there is significant abatement potential across end user sectors and hence uh, some action on green hydrogen would be crucial and we'll watch out for that uh, biofuels uh, are again an important aspect from a blending uh, perspective as uh, you know fossil fuels will remain a uh, 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 a mainstay for some time to come and uh, uh last but not the least i think carbon capture utilization or storage is another important technology um today it is expensive uh, but necessary thrust uh, will be required uh, to transition to net zero especially given that uh, uh, you know large emissions and gradual replacement will only happen uh, uh, to clean technologies uh just enlisted some few important aspects both on the policy side as well as financing side uh, uh, which are critical to promote these um i think basis uh, uh, integrated planning will be very important because the lines between different fuel sources is disappearing very soon and basis planning setting targets timelines are important project preparation uh, again is extremely critical uh uh for uh, uh, these kind of new technologies business models incentives will be important and uh, some sort of subsidy support from the government uh, credit enhancement mechanisms all of this i think together uh, uh, are very important for a uh, building out a robust uh, ecosystem as far as uh, such green technologies are concerned so that's all i had uh, uh, from my side thank you thank you that was very enlightening so now i'll just move on to the questions 
quickly. Uh, this is the first question has come from Mohit Arora. Uh, you briefly touched upon it in your hit and miss slide. So I'll just uh, go ahead and ask you. He says uh, the weak financial profile of state-owned distribution utilities, DISCOMs, continues to remain a key concern for the entire value chain in the power sector. What initiatives do you foresee being taken to address this issue? So I think the government has been laying adequate thrust. We have seen two, three rounds of restructuring, which have already happened. Uh, as we speak, uh, there is a large uh, program that the government has uh, uh, you know, enlisted on the distribution side, where there is a lot of thrust on improving infrastructure, uh, installation of smart meters. Uh, and there is a lot of action already happening there. There are almost, I think, 15, 16 discoms have already applied for that uh, scheme. Uh, so that is a big uh, positive. Uh, over a period, we are also likely to see uh, different forms of, uh, of, of franchising or privatization happening uh, on discoms. It will be a gradual process, but uh, nevertheless uh, will start happening. So these are some of the aspects uh, that uh, the government is looking at uh, implementing. Surely, surely. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on to the next question from Rakesh Malik. Uh, this is on the sovereign bonds, etc. He says the overall investment potential to meet the policy target of 500 gigawatts capacity by 2030 has been estimated in the range of 20 to 22 trillion rupees. Introduction of so sovereign green bonds for public sector is a positive step, but is it viable? That's his question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh... We don't see any uh, material issue there. Like I said, uh, uh, we, India has also raised uh, uh, masala bonds uh, in the past. Uh, we have already seen a lot of institutions in India uh, uh, on the private side as well as on the public side raise uh, green bonds. Um, but uh, uh, some of the aspects, as long as they're taken care of, which I touched upon, alignment of the framework, uh, clarity in terms of the use of proceeds and regular monitoring. I think those are important uh, aspects. And see, frankly, it's not only uh, sovereign green bonds uh, that will uh, that will uh, you know help meet uh, some of these investments. It'll have to be a combination of uh, everything. So you will have to have your banking system. You will have NDFCs. You have uh, see, and over a period of time, I think a lot of these are long-term infrastructure assets. And we are already seeing a lot of interest from long-term investors. So be it the likes of pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, you are, you've already seen one invit happen in the, in the renewable energy space. So I think it will have to be a combination of all of this uh, that will together uh, support uh, uh, green infrastructure investments uh, in the country. Sure. So thank you. So I'll move on to the next question by Mr. Bharat Parekh. Uh, he's asking, what is the cost of biomass per TN, calorific value and cost per kilowatt for power? And how is torrified biomass economics different? Um, see, uh, the cost of uh, uh, biomass will obviously vary. Um, depending upon uh, where your plant is located, depending upon what you are able to source. Uh, broad level calculation uh, suggests that, uh, you know, it will be closer to about uh, five rupees uh, per unit uh, for uh, blending of uh, biomass. Um, and that is where I said weighted average cost will increase by about 11 to uh, uh, 15 paise per unit. Um, <clears throat> If, uh, if my memory serves me right, uh, for coal, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we will require about uh, approximately 650 uh, uh, kgs uh, per kcal, but uh, for, uh, uh, for biomass, it will be slightly higher, about uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So that's the kind of uh, differential uh, that uh, we will have for biomass. Sure. <clears throat> so I'll move on to the next question by Mr. Vishwanath Ataluri. Says uh, state governments need to come up with green hydrogen demand targets since green hydrogen is replacing the industrial feedstocks 
like fertilize refinery petrochemicals and use their re uh, thoughts on that sorry could you just uh, repeat that state should come out with green hydrogen targets correct since green hydrogen is replacing the industrial feedstocks like fertilize uh, refinery petrochemicals and their use of re um so yes uh, like i said that the government is uh, in the process of uh, of putting together a national hydrogen mission and within that we are at least expecting uh, some mandates from the government on specific sectors uh, to my mind it will be uh, 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 refineries uh city gas distribution fertilizers these will be some of the more low hanging ones where uh, we could see uh mandates being put and then gradually them being extended to other sectors as well as increased uh having said that i think <clears throat> mandates will have to be clubbed with some sort of uh incentives uh, be it uh, to uh, manufacturers of electrolyzers or to suppliers of uh, green hydrogen or be it even on the demand side so there will have to be some sort of uh, incentive mechanism at least in the initial stage and uh, i always believe that you know there should uh, there should be a clear road map that they should suggest in terms of a phased incentive mechanism where one is aware that you know today it is x going forward it becomes 80% of x then it becomes 60% of x so that's how it should be structured from a long term investor clarity perspective okay sure so i'll just move on to the next question quickly i know we're a little short on time but i'll just ask uh, two three more questions um so see ravi chandrashekharan has asked do you see uh, in india individuals or citizens involving in green energy production by installing solar panel like what's happening in europe where nano or micro grid setup is there india is more on institutional implementation rather than peer to peer join the joining the network um i would partially agree um so solutions uh, such as rooftop uh, the way it was envisaged has uh, unfortunately not happened uh, there are several measures which have been taken by uh, the center uh, by providing subsidies there are uh, benefits uh, which different states have also put in uh, to incentivize uh, rooftops but uh, given that uh, discoms view this as a threat of eating into profitable consumers it hasn't really taken off in a very big way uh, see it's a matter of uh, time and we've seen prosumers uh, uh, being popularized uh, quite quickly and it's a matter of time when uh, you know storage becomes uh, cost effective and uh, you essentially become grid neutral so you know if the discoms don't change they'll be forced to change over a period uh that is as far as you know rooftops are concerned in remote access i think uh, there are some uh, in fact companies where even large oil and gas majors have made investments uh, where uh, uh, small or mini grids uh, are being set up in remote areas uh, to provide electricity access so yes uh, you know not adequate has been done but yes there are uh, 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 action that is happening on ground and going forward i think uh, we will certainly see this uh, accelerating so i'll move on to the next question from ragunath it's a two part question uh, he is i'll start with the first one it says budget allocations have been noticed to be the corporate few instead of public at large similar government measures if made simpler for larger public to be participative then there will be big change that india is seeking at the most so the first question is large many over small few and the second is do you see government coming out with such formulated guidelines for the small investors to install in solar wind to cover even the small communities so i think uh, uh... i wouldn't say that is not done so in fact uh, here also i think they have exp- uh, ex- if i'm not i don't remember the numbers but i think they have extended uh, uh, credit credit enhancement uh, <coughs> to msmes uh, even in this budget so i think uh, they clearly appreciate the 
uh, the contribution uh, and the volume that uh, these uh, entities can bring in uh, and given that they are not always credit worthy such kind of uh, credit enhancement measures have been taken uh, uh, into picture and as long as you are uh, you know uh, have op or you're operating on uh, in a sustainable manner having your equipment quality and all that which is up to the mark i think uh, there are uh, uh, guidelines measures through which uh, you know empanelment can happen uh, through necessary nodal agencies mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, kind of uh, smaller players can also join the force oh, at least i don't see any major issue there surely i hope that answers his question as well uh, can I ask you one last question before we uh, end the yeah, call? Yeah. Okay. Sure, sure. So it's come from Chamakuzi Subramanian. He asks, do you think green hydrogen sector global competition will be hectic at future date? It's a very broad question, but it would be great to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, um, I think if you see any sort of fuel, I think uh, be it oil, uh, be it gas, I think a competition has uh, always uh, been tight and here also it is going to be no different. I think a lot of uh, uh, economies are trying to take the first uh, step. I think uh, to my mind, India has a fair degree of advantage here and that's where we do not want to miss the bus and there will be a lot of measures being announced shortly in India also because uh, we are able to produce one of the lowest cost uh, renewable energy uh, in the country, we have large uh, consuming sectors. So I think in that context, yes, uh, competition will certainly be stiff. Uh, but I think India, uh, to my mind, will have uh, uh, a fair game or a fair share to play. And I think the dominance of some of the conventional economies, uh, at least as far as oil and gas is concerned, will start uh, diminishing. Great. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Master. Uh, such an insightful, engaging session and a privilege to hear you. Uh, our guests and I have been hooked on till the very end and I've taken up several nuggets. And uh, thank you to our leaders in the audience for joining us and for staying till the very end and asking for and for always asking excellent questions. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.